Let's discuss the principles of management. When you have a posterior capsular rupture in a patient with a polar cataract with an associated vitreous loss. What I have found is that when you do have a PCR in a patient with a polar cataract, almost always it's intraoperative and as a result of some intraocular manipulations. And more often than not, I tend to find it at the end of epineuclis removal when we are starting to remove the cortex, signifying therefore that it has occurred at some point in the surgery prior to this stage. Let's now move to watching the surgery. The nucleus management was uneventful. We start the surgery from the epineuclis removal. Following the completion of the nucleus management, it is clearly evident that there is no sign of any PCR. The chopper is replaced with a dialer and we proceed to the epineuclis removal with the epineuclis mode of FACO. With care and caution, the epineuclis is dislodged from within the capsular bag and is aspirated. Whilst removing the last part of the epineuclis, the horizontally located spindle-shaped tear of the polar cataract comes into view. Now you've noticed the PCR and you still have some epineuclis in the eye. What's the best way to manage this patient here on so that we can limit the damage to where we are now, not make matters worse and successfully remove the epineuclis, prevent the disturbance of vitreous and safely manage to implant an IOL within the ciliary sulcus. So whilst the figure probe is in the eye with the irrigation on and we notice the tear occurring in the posterior capsule, it's extremely important at that point not to withdraw the phaco probe because that's going to make the anterior chamber shallow and get the vitreous to herniate in the anterior chamber. So at this point, you withdraw the Sinsky hook and whilst maintaining the irrigation still in the eye, perform a viscofluid exchange. As the visco fills and replaces the fluid in the anterior chamber, the probe can then be withdrawn. In this particular case, however, despite performing a properly done viscofluid exchange, you can notice there's an extension in the size of the rent. This signifies the presence of a vitreous disturbance. In order to confirm the presence of disturbed vitreous, 4 mg and 0.1 ml of triamcinolone acetonide is injected into the anterior chamber. And the delineated vitreous appears like this. Notice the stained vitreous prolapsing out of the incisions. Almost always you'll find that the vitreous is disturbed. It tends to move to the path of least resistance, that is the incisions. You can also notice the disturbed vitreous filling the anterior chamber. We will now proceed to performing a limited anterior vitrectomy. In this particular case, I'm using a 20 gauge cutter. We start with cutting the vitreous that has prolapsed out of the incisions, as you can see here. For the introduction of a 20 gauge cutter into the anterior chamber, the paracentesis incisions often need to be enlarged. The irrigation is first introduced from the opposite side prior to the introduction of the cutter. Having introduced the cutter, the vitreous is now cut from just within the wound. Typically at that point where the vitreous tends to prolapse out of the incision. You will notice then how we then proceed to cut the vitreous in the area of the pupillary plane. And having completed that, we then move to the area just above the PCR. So how does one decide that the vitrectomy is complete? You will find in this case that the edges of the PCR have moved closer to each other, signifying that the vitreous has been cleared completely from that area. Following the successful completion of the vitrectomy, the vitrectomy probe is now removed from the eye and a viscofluid exchange is performed once more prior to removing the irrigation out of the eye. You will notice that the tear in the posterior capsule has regained its normal shape. With the anterior chamber now free of vitreous, let's move to the implantation of the three-piece IOL in the ciliary sulcus. The safe implantation of a three-piece IOL requires for the main incision to be enlarged to 3.4 millimeters. The incision, so suitably enlarged, allows for the ease of the entry of the nozzle of the cartridge halfway through, in fact a little more if required, into the anterior chamber to allow for the ease of the insertion of the leading haptic. The loading of the three-piece IOL should always take place under the direct visualization under the microscope. It is pushed in front to the front of the nozzle, after which its orientation at the tip of the nozzle always needs to be carefully examined. 
A mental note should now be made of the orientation of the nozzle within the eye to be able to achieve the horizontal orientation of the leading haptic as shown here. Let's now move to the IOL insertion. Counter pressure is afforded with the Sinsky hook held in the paracentesis incision and the nozzle is introduced and rotated into the eye to achieve the correct optimal orientation of the leading haptic. Having achieved that, the haptic is now introduced with care and caution into the ciliary sulcus after which the rest of the IOL is injected into the anterior chamber. Following this, the IOL is rotated so as to get the trailing haptic into the anterior chamber. While rotating the IOL in the ciliary sulcus, the leading haptic accidentally slips out of the sulcus into the anterior chamber. Now the entire lens is in the anterior chamber. Once more viscoelastic is placed into the anterior chamber to deepen it, and with the help of a Kuglin hook hitched at the trailing optic haptic junction, first the trailing haptic, and now the leading haptic is once more rotated in the ciliary sulcus. It is rotated even further to be able to achieve an orientation of the IOL such that the haptics are at right angles to the tear, as you can see here. And you can see the end result that is achieved here. An anterior chamber free of the epinucleus cortex or vitreous, a stable posterior capsular rupture, and a stable placement of a three-piece IOL in the ciliary sulcus with the haptics at right angles to the PCR. After completing the IOL insertion and ensuring its stability, the excess viscoelastic is washed out from the anterior chamber and the wounds hydrated. I hope you did find this video tutorial useful. Thank you.